Perfect. Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah. So I'm Paul McLaren, uh, MM0 uh, ZBH. Um, just a bit of a health warning perspective. This is about five years worth of success and failure. So don't expect to take everything in. From a, a success perspective, if you come to the end of this and think actually that's something that's of interest, you know, feel free to, to give me a shout, knock on my door, catch me later, um, you know, now six months or whatever, um, you know, and we can you know, discuss it further. Um, so from a gender perspective, I'm. Look at the, the definition of remote. Um, I'll do a quick intro on what we're looking to, to cover in this presentation. Um, why remote uh, makes sense uh, or not, as the case may be. Um, some of the common components um, that you would use for a remote setup. Um, some of the solutions, again, I'll drop a, a number of different solutions um, that I've seen or used uh, within the presentation. Um, and then at the end, measuring success. So again, working out, you know, has it been worthwhile? Okay, so from a, a definition of remote perspective, um, I'm conscious that you know remote in some people's eyes it can be a controversial um, subject. Oh, that's interesting. Why is it turning itself off? Do you want me to say the hand yeah. mic? Is that easier? Uh, huh? No. Do you want me to say the hand mic? Oh, uh, you can do it if you like, but uh, we should be able to get that. Maybe the battery's gone flat on it. Okay, is that? Uh, Okay, perfect. Sorry about that. Um, okay, so yeah, conscious remote can be quite a bit of an emotive subject for some people. Um, you know, it can be. You know, you know, it has some had some bad press, but from my personal perspective, um, it's about you know obviously connecting to a radio that's located in a different location to the operator. So, for example, you know, from home connecting to a remote site, um, and away from home connecting back to the home shack, um, or, or, or potentially another location. Um, most importantly, obviously, operated in licensed conditions. Now, I don't think there's, you know, the, the license issued by Ofcom isn't overly strict about remote, but we are seeing, you know, creeping into a number of contests now, you know, remote as a, a separate category, or certainly guidance on what's acceptable, you know, within the use of remote uh, or not. Um, and then probably the, the third, the, the final part there, most important to myself, um, you know, something that's self-built, um, so not using a third-party online service, um, you know, this to me was about you know building something that effectively was an extension you know my own station. Okay, so just from an intro perspective um, about myself, so in my job um, I'm a solution architect. So for users who are not aware of that, um, I solve problems um, against customers' requirements. Um, it's not my job to know about the end level of detail. I'm not a hands-on techie. Um, so, but you know I do work in the networking infrastructure um, and software spaces, um, it's my role really to kind of know about you know, how things work um, you know, and, and what problems they can solve. And I suppose my remote station construction has you know, used those kind of skills um, you know, to kind of bring that together. From a solutions perspective, as I said earlier on, um, I'll cover four different types of solutions. Um, I'll look at the building blocks that you might use to, to put a remote station together. Um, but from a you know, a design perspective, there's no right or wrong way of doing this. Um, you know, the designs are interchangeable, um, and you say, you know, it's a learning process. You know, and I'd be happy as well if people came to me and said, actually, I've done this, but I've done it differently. You know, I'm always looking to improve. Um, from a skills perspective, again, probably one of the things that puts people off. You know, it's it's probably in, in a number of areas that you might not have comfort at the moment. So there's a bit of solution design. Remote stations can be quite complicated, or, or they can be quite simple. There's some networking. Um, potentially some software configuration as well. Um, you know, a number of packages that you might want to use to bring it together. Um, you could do some coding um, and bring that into the solution as well. Um, automation is, is a key part, so making sure things work because you are not there. Um, you know, again, you may use automation in your, your home station, but a remote station takes that to the next level. Um, a little bit about security. Um, you know, it is somewhere that you're not going to be, so you, know, you obviously want to make sure that you don't attract the, the unsavory types. Uh, to cause problems, um, and then finding a perfect location, um, which you know for some people may mean um, you know something a little bit better than what you do today, or it might be something completely fantastic, you know, compared to what you're you're using at home at the moment. Uh, but overall, um, you know, remembering the the principles of you know amateur radio, you know, it is a a learning hobby, um, you know, in the technical area, and you know, building a remote station, I've found really has been a great technical project, you know, and learning opportunity. Okay, so why remote? Um, you can probably look at that list there, um, and depending on how lucky you are, 
Um, you know, we're not we're not all happen to live in you know multi-acre estates with no neighbours where we can put antennas up. You know, do what we fancy. So these kind of problems, you know, you can probably tick the list. You know, the killer for me, you know, VDSL when that arrived, you know, that knocked out a lot of bands. You know, I like to be able to hear the DX. You know, that is important to me. I'm not really a kind of rag chewer talking to other guys at you know five nine plus. You know, personally, you know, I, I want to hear those weak signals. Switchboard power supplies. I can't remember what Christmas it was. Maybe Christmas 2017. Some neighbour brought some, you know, complete pile of crap, and it just basically, you know, knocked out everything from 30 metres down. Um, from a space perspective, I live in a normal house. You know, I've got a fairly big, you know, garden that's, you know, 40 metres long from front to back, but my house sits in the middle, 10 metres wide. You know, I can do some stuff, but you know, I'm always eager to do more. Um, local hams. So. I was conscious that other guys nearby who had similar stations to me were working DX that I couldn't hear, and it wasn't really a geographic thing. You know, I thought on 40 meters that my you know noise floor was quite low, but I was hearing guys nearby working. You know, what's it VK7AC? Right? Couldn't couldn't hear him. So I said, well, something not quite right there. Um, so again, solving that problem. W, you know, web SDR testing. So whilst I mentioned earlier on, you know, I don't really look to use, you know, SDRs as part of my solution. From a testing perspective, you know, I could put the, you know, a call out on 40 meter CW. I'd have, you know, 20 university SDR running on the side, and I'd see, you know, the trail of CW signals calling back to me. And again, I wouldn't be able to hear them. So, you know, it's a, you know, a, a, again a frustration. Neighbours, you know, my neighbours are great. I don't fall out my neighbours, and I've always made a, a point of keeping on side with them. But you're always worried about, you know, we all think antennas are things of, a thing of beauty, but let's be realistic. You know, we're, we're probably in a minority. Um, QRO interference. So, you know, with the, uh, I suppose, the, the, the increase in electronics in the house, you know, interfering with my own broadband. We got a new boiler. Um, I was causing that to cut out, you know, various things going on. You know, I, I was always paranoid about that, you know, that, that call from downstairs, you know, dad, dad, the internet's gone off. Um, and, and I knew it was probably going to be me. Um, set up time, um, my low band antennas sit in the front garden. My wife never did really notice the 18 meter spider pole that used to go up, you know, after dark. But all these things take time. Um, you know, and again, my wife, you know, absolutely love her, but you know, she does not see ham radio junkyard as being a thing of beauty. You know, and, and we can all be in denial, but it's really a fact. Um, and again, QTH limits. So I probably had a, a number of areas that I would call my nemesis. So the Pacific, it was probably an area that I just was conscious I was not getting into and I wasn't hearing and, and obviously being able to do something about that. So again, you know, I'm sure a number of those, unless you're very lucky, you, you'll be able to, uh, you know, to, to reconcile with. Okay, so first solution, um, this is really an icebreaker, simplest digi solution, that you, sorry, sim simplest remote solution, so remote digi modes, um, no network skills required, a number of you might be doing this already, you need your home PC connected to your radio running your favourite digi software, Chrome browser and then Chrome remote desktop installed on a tablet, mobile phone or whatever and you can connect to your home station from wherever. You don't need to be within range of your Wi-Fi. You can do it from work. You know, you can do it from the shops. You could do it from here. Um, it's good. It's effective, but it's it, it's limited. But it gives you a kind of you know a, a, an intro on what you know remote could offer. So I say I'm, I'm, I'm sure of you. You know, there'll be a number of people in here that will know that already. But I just wanted to cover this just on the basis of you know because sometimes when you get shown these things like well, that's obvious. I never realised that that everyone else was doing that. And um, that's what. But say and then then coming next. Um, once I'd kind of you know reconciled myself with my problems, um, let's call this the remote tree. This was an article in CDXC in about 2017 that I got asked to to write. Um, it was a reception only solution, so it was solving you know a number of my problems. It offered an immediate improvement to, as I say, the reception issues. It was a bit limited in deployment. You know, my remote RX you know receive you know you know revolved around this tree. You did need some basic network and software skills. Um, it did involve some setup time, um, again, a single antenna, and there was a limited you know, battery duration. Um, you know, when I was at first looking at this, I would walk around with a dog thinking, there must be somewhere around here, right, if I could just remove the reception from the house to somewhere else, right, that I could get a better reception. You know, I looked at the cracks in the road, could I maybe run a bit of coax down there after dark? You know, 
you know, maybe, you know, th there's all sorts of things, you know, I would drive about and I would see, you know, uh, only if I lived near that roundabout in Livingston that had all the trees in the middle, because I could stick something in the middle of the roundabout, you know, and, and Wi-Fi over to it. So, the, 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 as I say, the, the, the outcome of that was this tree, um, a number of, you know, meters away from the house. Okay, so just to give you an idea, I'll check the pointer. So my house here, okay, 300 meters away is a tree. Okay, so I was receiving here, but still transmitting from here, sending the reception audio from the remote side, and I'll cover how I did that in a second, uh, up, to, up to the house. Okay, that was done through line of sight Wi-Fi, and again, was my kind of first foray into you know, doing, you know, doing some, something remote. Okay, so what did that look like? Um, you probably won't be able to see this because it's quite discreet. There is a small directional Wi-Fi antenna sitting on the roof that uses five gig Wi-Fi, so similar Wi-Fi that you would use in the house. And then secondly, um, there is this kit here. What that mainly revolves around is a small Windows PC that runs the SDR console server software. So that's effectively picking up the audio from a RSP Play um, SDR radio. Um, that then is sending it over a Wi-Fi link, as I say, back to the house, and it's been powered by a seven amp hour battery. So I could get a few hours out of that, but it was a few hours of really joyful reception that I wasn't able to get from the house. Okay, and then the coax end here would effectively be deployed, you know, or would be plugged into the wires that I had up the tree. Okay, so if this is all sounding a bit crazy and mad, yeah, it probably is, but it, but it works really well. Okay, that gets bundled up into a waterproof box, a little bit of camo on here, so it doesn't look like a white thing sitting in the middle of a field that might attract attention. Um, that gets put into a bag, and then I take the dog for a walk, um, stick it over the wall, point the, the Wi-Fi um, antenna towards the house, see the signal lights come up, and I was good to go. Back up to the house, as I say, a five minute walk away, and on my Shack PC, I was running the SDR console um, software, okay? That was linked, obviously, to the radio, so it followed the band tracking of the radio, but this was, obviously, receiving the audio from the remote site, which was you know, significantly better than what I was able to receive in the house. Okay, and then from a, a solution diagram perspective, again, the key part here being, right, audio from the laptop is being played through my headphones, but I have the radio turned down, because I'm obviously not interested in the, you know, the, reception, the received audio at the house, but I still do obviously want to pick up the site, you know, the CW site tone. Um, and then again, the bits here that sat in the bag, and then more importantly, the wireless bridge that connected up the two parts. So again, not ideal for everybody, but just to give you an idea of what's possible um, and how this kind of journey started for myself. But like all good things, it comes to an end. You can't see this quite clue clearly, but planning permission got granted for the field. Cala decided to build 80 houses, and uh, remote, remote tree was no more. Okay, so you know, again, a, f a familiar, you know, and if anybody knows Abadour, where I live, um, you can imagine um, how much traffic that caused on the local Facebook group with the, uh, with, with the various NIMBYs. But, it, you know, it was probably an important moment because the, the remote bug had, you know, ha had bitten. So I then decided, actually, you know, I should maybe look at trying to do this properly. Okay, so looking at a remote site design, point number one, nobody advertises a remote radio station for rent. Okay, nobody will say to you, come and stick your 60 foot tower in my land because I think it's gonna look beautiful, okay? You will have to go out and find a remote location to, to use, okay? It needs power, that's obviously most important, but from a what's right perspective, you probably need to think about that yourselves. You know, do I want several acres to do something fantastic or do I just want a small corner at the back of a mate's garden so I can stick a wire up a tree, you know, run a radio that's connected to the internet and just do something that's better than I have in the house at the moment, okay? And then from a design principles, again, a number of points here, um, which, as I say, design principles, lessons learned. So, you know, what I've learned over the last few years. So understanding the common components, you know, which I'll cover in the next few slides, you know, how to, to wh what are good things to build a remote station. Um, from a connectivity perspective, devices that use IP or USB are very important, okay, because they work well when you're not, you know, on the same location. Uh, make it an incremental build, so you know, make sure your remote location doesn't have worse reception you know, um, <laughs> than your home location, um, and, and trying to build things up over time. You know, a remote station does not happen overnight. From a network design perspective, consider a LAN-to-LAN -LAN VPN. If you don't know what that means, don't worry about it. Just remember I've told you, it just offers you scalability in the future of when you're connecting to the station over the internet. 
from a device's perspective, again, you are not there. You cannot tweak a knob, you cannot change a band. You know, your hands are you're going to be several miles away from where these things are. So think about how you monitor, control, and fix devices. Um, and again, the automation part there, you know, as much automation as possible because that's your hands at sight. Um, security, again, proportionate to your location choice. You know, if you stick an 80 meter tower, sorry, an 80 foot tower up, somebody will probably come and have a look. You know, if it's not in the right location. So, you know, think about that. I even found that, you know, wires up a tree, you know, attra attracted nosy parkers. You know, they're not going to damage stuff, but, you, you know, you just need to think about these things. Uh, weatherproofing, again, if you're running a remote station, some stuff might be outside. Um, single pane of glass, um, I'll touch on that later. That's quite important because if you are connecting to a remote, um, you know, set of services, being able to do it slickly, you know, and through one computer screen, you know, it, it is an important feature. And then finally, keep a design document. So, you know, the number of times I've been out there and thought there was a spare port in the LAN switch or something was plugged into something else and actually got there and found out that, that wasn't the case. So, you know, write things down because it's not in front of you. You can't go and check quickly. Okay. And then success, um, low number of site visits is probably key. I think my record is probably about three months not having to go on site, um, operating the radio every day. But, you know, as I say, from a visit perspective, you know, you know, low, low visits unless you're building something is good. Okay, so I'm just going to go through a number of the common components that you would use to build a station. Again, this is not a definitive list, and I'd happily take, you know, when people say, actually, I've done that differently, you know, there's a better way of doing it, but if you're starting from scratch to give you an idea, I would always recommend having some sort of PC on site, you know, a mini PC, which is probably about, you know, just a little bit bigger than the size of my hand. It's perfectly adequate for running the software that you will need for a remote site. Okay, um, you will connect to that PC using something like, say, Google Remote Desktop or VNC. Okay, um, that allows you to, as I say, remotely control the PC from your home shack. Okay. Um, next part, obviously, USB relays. So again, something you may be familiar with if any of you do home automation, IoT, those kind of things. Um, those are fairly common for that. Great little tool for remote sites to do a whole load of different low voltage tricks. Um, Arduino, again, if you are, you know, into tech uh, in other areas, Arduinos are used for teaching, um, easy to buy, and they can be a great solution for, you know, analog and digital control or monitoring of non-USB devices. In my early iteration of the remote station, I had a um, RM, I can't remember what it was, anyway, so solid state amp, um, you know, basically, uh, you know, did all the HF bands, um, but was a little bit intermittent, it would occasionally trip, so, I would use the Arduino with some wires soldered across the, the alarm LED to work out what the voltage was it was going through. Okay, I ran a little computer script on my um, on the mini PC, and if the if the amp tripped, the voltage would change from zero volts to, to five volts, and I knew that there was a problem. I then used the USB relay to power cycle that and get it back online. Okay, and that obviously saved me having to go out on site. Okay, and then from a router perspective, so your remote station will be, you know, be possibly connected over the internet or, or Wi-Fi, but if you're connected over the internet, again, a router that supports VPN, the, this kind of area can be complicated if you don't understand it, so get some help. I, I do it on a daily basis, so it kind of you know, becomes reasonably normal to me, um, but if you're looking at, as I say, mobile broadband, there is a number of options there. Um, what I found was that 4G isn't always as good as it claims to be, you know, you need low latency and low jitter for stable audio. Again, if you don't know what these terms mean, you know, you know, look look them up. But in the same way that if at work you use Teams or Zoom, you know, low latency and jitter is good for a you know for for, for a quality session. You need the same sort of capability with your remote station. Okay. What I found was that um, you know, GIF GAF, um, their 4G absolutely rubbish. The one that worked for me at my site was Vodafone, but again, it may be different depending where you are. You may also want to look at, if you have it on site, you know, fixed broadband, but that might bring VDSL issues, you know, as part of that. Okay. Um, bandwidth requirements, you don't need a load of bandwidth to do remote radio. I run probably, you know, the, the, it probably runs about under two meg on my, on my remote site, but, you know, the actual requirement is, is significantly lower than that. And again, as I said, if you don't understand that part, get some help, you know. Happy to help anyone that's interested. Okay. From an antenna perspective, um, you may want to look, obviously, if you're doing you know, Wi-Fi, as I, as I touched out in the previous example, you know, 
you can see from your house, you know, a great remote location you can get access to, you know, using something like this antenna. Um, you know, there's guys doing, you know, five, 10 kilometer range, um, you know, Wi-Fi links. Um, or if you're using 4G, um, you know, a directional 4G antenna. There's a couple of websites. There's the Solwise website that allows you to work out, you know, line of sight from where you are to where you want to be for Wi-Fi. Um, and then there's a cell mapper website which shows you the coverage for um, mobile phone networks in a little bit more detail. It also shows you where the masts are located so you know where you want to be pointing things. Yeah. Bringing all this together, you will need some sort of network switch. So again, just some sort of cheap LAN switch from, from Amazon. Um, don't underestimate the number of ports you need. You know, I've now replaced my switch, what, three times? Because I thought I just needed five. It was going to be fine. Um, and, and it's gone up, you know, since then, uh, the more things that I've got plugged in. Okay, and then, again, a remote antenna switch. So this falls into the automation side. So on the left here, this model is a remote rig um, antenna switch that tracks the band data, um, integrates with the remote rig radio units, which I'll touch on in a second. Um, and again, that runs on the remote, uh, on the remote PC. Okay. If you've got Yagi's out there, you probably want some rotator software. So again, this is not you know, remote specific, but the PST rotator software, I, I use that. That works really well. That integrates with a, a USB controller for my, my SPID row um, antenna rotators. Um, and again, not the only one doing that. You know, Green Heron, a number of other boxes allow IP integration. But again, that can be controlled from your, uh, your remote PC. Okay, and then depending on what you're doing, you might want to look at some sort of environmental monitoring. The enclosures I use are quite tight, so you know, airflow can be a bit of an issue. So understanding what's going on, and then from a security perspective, some sort of camera. Now, this is not the ultimate security, but there's something just comforting, just being able to look at the remote site. I, I don't know why, but just be able to see things are okay. Not that I'd be able to do much about it if there was going to be a problem. And again, that comes down to you know, obviously choice of location. And you know, cameras, you could use that as well for if you've got you know, towers, you know, Yagi's up, being able to see where they're pointing, you know, check things over. You, know, you can get various security cameras online you know, from multiple sources. Okay, and then just before we get onto the, sort of the final parts here, so remote power, again, your hands on site. So there's quite a lot of number of options. You can you know, get home automation type power plugs. So the ones on the left that allow you through an app to be turned things on and off. You know, most of the time, things will run great, but it'll just be when that DX turns up, right, and something trips out, something fails, you need to be able to, to reset it, okay? These work over IP, so they do require, obviously, your network connection to be up from the remote site, you know, from your house to the remote site. If that's not the case, the GSM socket is the big switch, okay? If everything goes wrong, you can send a text to this, it will pick it up over, you know, the 2G network, so, you know, so over the mobile phone network, and you can send a message basically, turn, turn all the power off, turn all the power back on, okay? That then allows you to, as I say, make sure things do, do reset as on. That's another important feature, but effectively, you know, if, if something happens, you know, bring things back to normal, okay? And then from an enclosure perspective, you may be lucky and find out, obviously, you've got a mate who's got a great garden, happy to have your kit there. He's got a shed. You can stick stuff in that. But if you do have to put stuff outside, there's a number of different options. I mean, just for reference, I use dry box, which are these little boxes on top. Um, they're great for, you know, sticking an antenna switch out in the distance for a, you know, for a beverage antenna. And then I use these larger boxes, which are probably about the, probably about the size of that table there, maybe just a bit smaller. Um, and you can stick your radio, your, your amp, your remote PC, other devices in there. Get a couple of fans from Screwfix. Um, you know, screw them into the end, wire them into the uh, into the power sockets, um, and then you can obviously, if you see the temperatures going up inside, you can get some sort of airflow running through that. Okay, and then finally, probably the most important component, the radios. So, not every radio is remote friendly. Um, there's probably three categories. There's the, the software controlled rig, what I would call. So. Um, you know, using something uh, like the software up on the top right. So, you know, ICOM's RSBA software, the WinK 4K3 suite, um, or RigPi, um, again, that provides you with a software front end to control your radio. The one in the middle, um, remote head style, so using the remote rig RRC1258 units, which are these units here on, on the bottom left. That is what personally what I use, okay? And I'll cover the reasons why uh, that was the choice. That supports a rig which might have a, a, you know, a remote head like an, I, you know, an, I, an ICOM 7100, some various Kenwood models, um, also the Elecraft K0 um, as well. Um, and then finally, 
software-defined radios, so things like Flex. Um, just a note here, Flexes need Layer 2 VPNs, okay? Don't, 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 don't worry about remembering that, but the message there being, just because a radio can plug it into a network does not mean a radio is suitable for connecting to over the internet, okay? We often find things that are designed, you know, on a local LAN, it doesn't stretch well if you're trying to do it at distance. Again, that's a bit of a moot point, but when it catches you out, you know, you'll remember, you know, that, that point, okay? And then again, there is the physical versus software experience. For me personally, I wanted something that looked and felt like a radio. You know, I've not quite got into the, you know, be able fully controlling everything off a PC. Um, so again, hence the reason of using the, the remote rig boxes. And then the final point being the ability to configure the network parameters. So as I touched on, you know, when you're connecting over the internet, if you're used to doing Zoom, Zoom calls, you know, Teams, things like that, the internet can be a bit choppy. Okay, so being able to have buffers, delay, that kind of thing to smooth the audio out, to smooth out the sending of CW, um, either transmitted audio or received audio are important features. Okay, so again, don't worry about understanding all this. I just put it in here for reference. Okay, this is what my remote station looks like, okay, from a logical perspective. So I've got, I'll stop using this because it'll probably be a bit easier. I've got ma mains power down the bottom, okay. That's got the GSM socket switch plugged in, you know, the big switch. That sits on an IP power bar, so I can turn any device on and off if required. Okay, I've got a number of devices like the cameras, the environmental monitors, I've got the own power supplies. I've got the router that I use. That creates a VPN over the internet back to my house. So that is effectively my connection from the house to my remote site. I've got the remote rig device. I've got the, the radio. Um, I've got the antenna switch. Um, I've got the remote, the the rotator controller, that all connects into a LAN switch over Ethernet, um, and then I've got a remote antenna switch that allows me to flick in my receive antennas, okay? And then from a color coding perspective, anything that's on USB is, is, is blue, anything that's on Ethernet is green, and anything that's power is, is red. Again, I wouldn't expect you to replicate this, but just from a reference perspective, it gives you an idea how it hangs together. Okay, and then finally, I'll just update the home side. Uh, a lot simpler, okay? I've still got some mains power. I've still got a power bar. Again, this is my shack. Okay, I've got a number of devices plugged in. I've got the VPN coming from my house router going over the internet to the remote site. And then I've got the other end of the remote rig box with my radio head unit plugged into that. Okay, this is what it looks like, okay? Again, trying to get something that looked and felt like a normal radio station was important, okay? So... This laptop here, I've got the screen stretched across both devices, okay? And I'll, I'll, show, I'll show you in a second what's on that. I've got my mouse, which allows me to control the, the laptop and the PC. I've got the head unit of the ICOM 7100. On the right-hand side, I've got the remote rig box, which again, connects over the internet to the remote rig box where the base unit of the ICOM 7100 sits. And then I've got my CW Kia um, plugged in as well. So again, something that looked and felt like a, you know, a normal radio station. Okay, and then looking at the, the laptop itself, just to give you an idea, um, this part here is actually the PC at the remote site. Okay, so I'm looking at the remote site PC. That's my, ante my antenna rotator controller. I've got the AMP software running. I've got the USB software running that allows me to flick in the, the receive antennas. I've got the be able to control the receive antennas, so which beverages I want to use. Okay, and then on the right-hand side, um, that is the actual you know, software I've got running on the laptop in the shack. So I've got my logger software running, and then I've got a ping running. So by sending a ping packet to the remote site, I can get an immediate idea if there's any issues. And generally, I would say 99.9% .9 of the time, the network is stable, okay? You will get occasional problems, but you know that, that's worth bearing, okay? And then finally, solution number four. Um, this isn't something I use, but might be of interest if you've got multiple users looking to share a remote site, obviously one at a time. So you might have people you know, in a club um, or somebody who's got a, a home location that's really good that they want to share. Um, this came up through conversation with uh, another op who had helped set up a remote station um, and he was having trouble, trouble with the flex and this was highlighted as a solution. So when you see these stations possibly, maybe remote hams, this isn't how they do it, but um, you know, stations that are available to be shared by a number of people, it's this kind of setup, okay? So users connect from anywhere to a cloud VPN service. So you could have your station set up, 
you could be, you know, in a coffee shop, in a hotel, you know, wherever, and you know, connect to to, to the um, the remote radio. Um, best suited for software control radios. Obviously, the downfall of my solution that I use. If you haven't got the ICOM, you know, head unit in your house or, or in front of you, you can't control it. But for people looking for the full software experience using Smart SDR, that works well with this. It does obviously need the other common components, so things like you know. How do you control your rotator? How do you control your amp? All those kind of things would be built as part of this. But just to give you an idea, you know, if you thought doing remote on your own was too much, um, you know, there is options which allow you know a club, a group of friends, or whatever to be able to get that together. Okay, uh, and then finally, um, just looking at the success. So this is the last slide. Um, has it worked? Yeah, I mean, I think I'm really enjoying radio again. Um, I was always conscious that I was spending more time fixing things and solving problems than I was actually getting on the radio. Um, you know, I can go and turn my radio on now if I see some DX on the cluster, and I can just go and work it straight away. So I had 204 DXCC on C in CW um, in 2021, and by club log stats, that was you know a pretty good score. Most of the home problems have been resolved. Um, you know, you, you know the you know, obviously my, my my wife is very happy. Um, I can buy things now; they go straight to the farm. She doesn't see them. Um, and various other benefits like that. Um, the Pacific is now workable. You can see, obviously, from the list there, Norfolk Island, you know, Fiji, Conway Reef, Marshall Islands, Mariana, you know, JD, yeah, JD slash Zero, you know, Rotuma, you know, all on the list last year, which, you know, by all accounts was a, was a pretty thin year, you know, for, for DX. Um, problems are not solved. Um, remote sites are obviously not as well cultivated as your home garden. I found out that the... the the site I use, which has good pest control, there is a few rats, and they do seem to like um, Cat6 co uh, Cat networking cables. They do, not, they do not have an appetite for Messi and Polini coax, which is quite good, because um, obviously a length of Cat6 is a bit cheaper. Um, gardening as well, so you, know, you need to take care of things. You know, I've, I, I, I'm constantly just checking, make sure you know, our elevated radials touching branches, those kind of things. Again, if you don't go on site in three months, you know, the change is quite significant. Um, and then as well, I am lucky with my location. It does have some good space, but I've been trying to be sensible around the build versus operate. I've avoided going into big engineering, um, things that are going to cause me problems. You know, I just run a hex, um, but it's on elevated ground. Um, I've got a, you know, a, a, a monoband um, Yagi 4, 410, um, and then a number of other wire antennas um, for, you know, you know, for, for the lower bands. So as I say, overall, it's been successful. It's probably been, you know, my lockdown project, if you want to call it that. Um, so it's probably taken about 18 months to get all this together. Um, a few things worked, a few things didn't. Um, hopefully, you know, if this if this does uh, appeal to you, um, you know, some of the learnings that I've done here might obviously save you some time. Okay, that's it. So um, I'll take any questions. Um, if not. <laughs> So yeah, happy to take any questions. Um, if not, yeah, happy to talk at the uh, you, know, uh, you know now or later. Um, okay. yeah. <laughs> um, personally, um, a farmer who went kids went to school with my kids, okay, um, and I asked him, but I did not get into the detail. Right, landowners do not want to hear about eighty foot lattice towers, right, or any of that kind of stuff. Have you got some spare land where you have some power and I can stick up some antennas? He said, is it for a hobby or is it commercial? Because right? all he's interested in, am I making money from it? I, I pay him a crate of beer a month and help him with some IT. Okay? But I think it's the, you know, don't bore people with the detail, keep it simple. Um, but, you know, looking at that, that's one option. I know somebody else who managed to find a disused. Um, um, I think they were like um, pig sheds or chicken sheds on a farm, and they pay a monthly lease on that. Um, I do have somebody I know as well who has a office right next to the beach at Abadawa, and I was really tempted to say to them, but I knew that would be limited probably to one antenna. Um, it, it's really just thinking around, you know, is that kind of place a goer? And, and just going for it. Because as I said earlier on, nobody will come to you and say, you know, come and stick your antennas in, in on my land. It, it will just not happen. Sorry, sorry, yep. Hi, Paul. Um, what are you running on six? Uh, I'm not on six at the moment. Not on 
not on six. Not on six. Not. Uh, one of the main reasons for that is uh, if I was on six, I would probably be on Digi. Okay. Um, running d um, the Digi software, the remote site can be a bit temperamental with the head unit at you know at at, at, the, at the home shack. It yeah. does work. It's just not ideal for leaving it on twenty four seven. Okay. Thank yeah. you. All right, but I will. I will. I will get there. <laughs> Thanks. Anybody else? Gordon? Right, right, sorry, yep. Did you use the 7100 purely because of the ease of joining up to the internet or because it's a wonderful radio? Uh, I think you know the answer to that and I will, I will completely agree. So yeah, that's, that's a problem I didn't, I didn't cover on here. Um, Yes, it was used because of these, because it was a cheap radio. You can plug it in, and you know, if I was going to improve it, that would probably be one of the areas that I would look to improve. Um, probably before I got bigger antennas. Um, I think being realistic, you know, having a good location now has identified a number of shortcomings with the 7100 in contest situations. <laughs> okay, Malcolm. Okay. Okay, thank you. Well